Hello, everybody. This is uh, Kadir Toktogulov. I'm executive director of Central Eurasia Leadership Alliance. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. We have a wonderful panel today uh, of our friends. We are I'm very excited about the uh, discussion that we're going to have about education uh, in, in a post-pandemic world. And uh, there will be an opportunity after uh, our friends uh, present and talk, uh, where there'll be an opportunity for a discussion to, for you uh, attendees to ask questions. There is a chat box in, in the bottom that you could use. There's also a Q&A box, which you can use to uh, ask questions. Also, there'll be an opportunity for you to use your microphones to ask questions and to engage in a discussion. For that, you would need to uh, raise hand. I think that should be possible somewhere in the bottom of, uh, of your Zoom window. But if you have any questions uh, or technical issues, please text me via the chat box. Um, once again, thank you for joining us. This is wonderful. Uh, one of the, uh, we haven't done this kind of uh, webinar in a while, Central Eurasia Leadership Alliance. And this one was designed specifically with uh, seller members in mind when we discussed uh, about uh, what kind of webinar we wanted uh, to have. I would like to thank uh, Alexander, Hikmat, and Alima for their time uh, and for their time and commitment uh, to Sela, but also to this uh, specific uh, uh, webinar. And I'm really thrilled uh, about everybody else that uh, joined that are joining us. I would like to give brief introduction uh, to about our uh, participants. Uh, with uh, the title of the webinar series, the first one in the series is Education in a Post-Pandemic World, Skills for the 21st Cent uh, Century. Uh, Alexander Djigilava, uh, he's a great friend of ours, uh, a lot, and a great friend of, uh, for many of us in the, in the network, also known to us as uh, Sandro. He's a member of uh, Sela Georgia. Uh, he has a great experience in education as a lecturer at various universities and organizations. And Alexander has also served at, uh, in key government positions, uh, which included uh, education minister and uh, vice prime minister of Georgia. He's uh, also a founder and CEO of a company uh, called Flowmaster.online. Uh, He's uh, an experienced mentor, coach, and uh, a TEDx speaker and a consultant. Thank you, Alexander, for being a part of the webinar. Uh, we also have uh, Hikmat Abdurrahmanov with us. He's a, an active member of uh, Sela Uzbekistan team. Hikmat is, a, is an entrepreneur, uh, co-founder of HM Partners group of companies uh, with uh, total staff of 100 people, of over 100 people. Uh, the companies uh, work in various fields uh, such as foreign trade, advisory services and uh, business education among many. He is very well known in Uzbekistan as a champion for entrepreneurship in, in his country. And uh, it looks like his uh, passion for entrepreneurship led him to co-found Uzbekistan's first uh, private university, team university. Uh, the mission of the university is to raise the next generation of entrepreneurs in Central Asia. Thank you, Hikmat, uh, for joining us. And we uh, have uh, Alima Bisenova, a Sela, uh, Sela Kazakhstan member. Alima, uh, to be able to join us today, had to, and I think she'll tell us a little bit about her uh, trip to be, to, to her, her trip to this <laughs> webinar, I would say, because she was driving to uh, be on time for, uh, to be able to join us. Uh, Alima is an assistant professor of anthropology in the Department of Sociology and and Anthropology at uh, Nazarbayev University, one of the leading universities in the region. Uh, she obtained her PhD. Sorry. I need to unmute you. Did you want to say something? Ali? I am an associate professor. Associate I was promoted professor. Two years ago. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is great news. <laughs> okay, yeah. 
that sent in Russian now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Adima obtained her PhD in 2012 at uh, Cornell University, has a bachelor's degree in Kazakh language and literature from the Karaganda State University and a master's in Middle East studies. So one thing that uh, uh, is common uh, for me and Alima is that we both studied in Ithaca. That's where Cornell University is. I was an exchange student at Ithaca College in the year of uh, 2001 and 2002. So we could uh, talk with her about uh, places we liked in Ithaca and what we liked and didn't like about uh, living and studying in upstate New York. Thank you everybody uh, for joining us. I uh, would like to uh, thank once again, all our panelists. The, uh, aim, the goal of our webinar was to have a discussion on uh, what kind of education uh, the countries of uh, Central Asia and the Caucasus should, should uh, aim to have after going through the pandemic, which is still ongoing. And uh, the questions that I wanted to ask to our panelists and uh, to uh, have a discussion around is uh, you know, the following questions. Uh, what's next and what we should look for when we talk about education? What lessons will we have learned when the pandemic is over? Uh, it's not over yet and it will take a few more months for the pandemic to come to its end. What changes should be made to the education sector of our countries? And uh, based on your observations, what has become irrelevant amid the pandemic? And, you know, one bit last question uh, would be what changes are uh, taking place in the education sector. With that, I would like to uh, hand over the floor uh, to Alexander Djedjilava. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, thank you, Kadir, for organizing this event. First of all, I think we need more and more such events. We have uh, excellent professionals and experts among our seller family and I believe that there's a lot that can be shared and uh, exchanged and thought together <clears throat> uh, uh, during any times, but uh, um, even more in such tough times that we have now. So to uh, start my uh, introduction, actually I, uh, as some of you know, in February I was, I joined um, MELA Mila 10 in uh, Jordan and one of the, as always, one of the most uh, uh, thoughtful and interesting presentation was of our dear friend Michael Cooley. And one of the things that stuck with me since that particular day is uh, how and when he said that storms are coming. So, and he repeated and kept repeating me. Each of us as a leaders need to, to start with the uh, discussion about the education. Uh, first of all, he was uh, telling us about coming storms in February. And when I returned, the first lockdown like went on in a couple of weeks. So it was immediate from the Mila into the storm, actually, that we went. Our training business, we are doing executive trainings mainly with the company called Management Academy and it immediately basically stopped. Uh, actually, it didn't stop, but it was like 10% of the activity uh, uh, that it was uh, before the pandemic, right? So we had plenty of time to think, think about it. But one thing that uh, I want to emphasize is that it is not uh, the storm or a storm. It is storms that are coming every five years. That's what Michael said. And that's when, 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 and he explained that not all the storms are global. Some storms will be yours personally. Some storms will happen in our family or with our loved ones. Some storms will happen in particular countries and we're looking at the storms around us all the time, right? Um, coming from that and going towards the education, right? We're saying that well, what I believe is that same title can be used actually to describe the education world in our century. So basically I believe that storms or, or results of the outer storms will be felt in the education system 
uh, every five years and during with between the storms at all the time, right? So one thing, as, as it was said earlier, one thing that is permanent is a change. So that's what, what, what I believe, right? When I started to think about how to reshape our own activities within the pandemic, right? I uh, went to the, how to say, uh, fundamental principles and I came along the document, which many of you may have uh, read and uh, seen, it is called Skills for the 21st Century. And this document is put together in cooperation of United Nations, led by United Nations and many of the international organizations. It is based on research, based on science, and it basically says, to, to make the introduction very short, that workforce in any country, in any geography, in any area, will get outdated, their skills will get outdated every five to seven years. And what the document says. And if you look at it from that point, even not having heard about Michael Cooley and his, his presentation, right? That's what people say based on the research. They say that skills that your students will receive in your universities or skills that your executives will receive in your trainings and executive programs will get outdated within five to seven years, right? So basically, uh, and we are seeing this around us. I'm sure that all of the participants of today's seminar do see the managers with their outdated uh, knowledge. Actually, around me in recent days, I met few managers who have graduated excellent schools, like best of the world, right? But haven't pro proceeded since then. They have not updated their knowledge, right? Same can be said about entrepreneurship delivered, taught at some universities with the books that are 20 years old. And imagine that entrepreneurship 20 years ago and entrepreneurship today, a completely different business, right? So what I want to concentrate in this introduction is that I believe that uh, main subject that we have to discuss in SELA, in MELA, in global networks, in higher education, vocational, executive education, and all areas is how to keep people actually learning, how to keep them engaged, how to uh, you remember that we, in our language, in many of our countries' languages, we say, I finished education in whatever, 1995, right? And that is very much outdated. I mean, you, you cannot finish education and all of us know, right? Being in the education business or education industry or any other business, everyone knows that we have to self-educate basically every day and every week. And every five to seven uh, years, all of your wardrobe because it becomes outdated. It's not part of it, but basically all of it, you need to move it out of your wardrobe and try to buy basically new skills, new knowledge and new approaches and new methods and so on, right? So our response to it, one of the responses and one of the problems that we saw is that trainings, executive education, is too expensive to really become continuous. I mean, you can't have a course of two or three months costing $20,000 or even $5,000 and expect that everyone will participate permanently and they, they will do it every year or something, right? So one thing that we are uh, working on is to try to make the executive education actually a permanent process. We have two projects and I won't go into much detail, but that we will briefly describe. For the top managers, we created the CEO club network basically, which tries to deliver uh, new skills, new education for CEOs every month. And that's forever, no, not, not for a particular period, but as a club, basically. And the second thing is switching into the uh, online, pre-recorded online education for the mid-level 
managers and the, this same will apply to other segments but as we are doing executive educations that's how we split products so for Sela and for Mela and global networks to to sum up my my part of introduction i believe that academy is brilliant and then reunions are brilliant and every bit and every a touch that we touch the network is amazing and full of positive emotions like today, right? But we need to be very clear about how to refill our leadership uh, baskets, basically, every year with, with, with uh, events like this, or maybe some different types of events we can use online, and we can use some, some other types. But basically, we, we I, I graduated Sela in 2012, right? And it's already eight years since then. So my knowledge received at Sela was outdated twice in this time. It was outdated and then it was outdated again. So basically I believe that we have to come together actually to think about how we can help each other and help each member as a leaders in their communities stay up to date, not only within the academy or within some events, but in the permanent permanent process. So that's probably my, my uh, introduction and I will love to get uh, uh, deeper into it with uh, questions and answers. Thank you, Kadir. Thank you, Alexander, uh, for uh, leading this uh, panel and uh, for your insights. I'm looking forward to our discussion once uh, all our panelists are uh, uh, done with uh, their remarks. I would like to hand over uh, the microphone, I would say, as we like to say in our part of the world, to uh, Hikmat Abdurrahmanov. He, uh, uh, I would particularly like him to uh, talk about how he saw uh, needs in education uh, change and emerge for entrepreneurs uh, because and during this uh, pandemic. But overall, I think uh, Hikmat has great wealth of experience and uh, knowledge about entrepreneurship and education. And uh, the fact that uh, he co-founded Team University uh, speaks volumes of his uh, commitment to education. Please, Hikmat. Kadir, thank you very much. I would like to take this chance to greet my friends. Uh, sorry, I didn't have a chance to do that properly. Sandro, good to see you <laughs> in a good health. Good to see you, Alima. Thank you, Kadir, for organizing this. And I can see that we have around 25 people overall participating at this conversation. Um, and it's, it's great. I think uh, it's great that Sela provided this platform for exchange of thoughts and ideas. And I would like to start this with um, a quick story of how Sela practically helped me to establish a university. Uh, this idea uh, was actually uh, being uh, kind of formed and crystallized for uh, almost two years during different trips, during uh, my education in Moscow in the School of Management of Skolkovo, uh, in, um, during the trips, uh, I mean business-wise, and uh, just uh, traveling to the neighboring countries. And uh, uh, while doing that, uh, we decided to see how private education really um, has been established, how, what stages it gone through during the uh, post-Soviet period, because comparing ourselves, I mean, Uzbekistan to UK or US is irrelevant, right? Because they've gone too far in terms of higher education, private higher education. So what we did is we called our friends. I called Sandro, I called uh, se several other friends, I called uh, uh, people in the Caucasus, in Central Asia, and uh, all of a sudden we had the um, almost ready program where uh, we had a wonderful opportunity to meet, not just to go to the campuses, but, al but actually meet with the rectors, meet with founders of universities. And uh, we were talking to them as if we were close friends. And I think that really speaks about power of Sela. So I'd like to thank all of my friends who participated. In, um, first of all, <laughs> Alexander, Sandro, because he is present here and still helping a lot. Uh, speaking about Speaking about uh, education in pandemics world, I would like to continue what Sandro said on uh, the, the world, which is changing very quickly. In traditional management uh, that I studied, I mean, my uh, both bachelor's and master's 
both here in Uzbekistan and, and outside, uh, we were told we were taught to delegate our powers. We were taught, taught to build proper structures, management structures. And uh, when pandemics hit, uh, I suddenly realized that actually we have to do the, the opposite. <laughs> we have to go back to our business processes. We have to go back to our teams. We have to actually lead the, uh, our teams through this very uh, chaotic, I would say, times. And uh, that's exactly what I did personally. I, um, I was kind of involved into so many public engagements, projects, and uh, from the in, from the early this year, I almost cut all my public commitments and uh, really went back to the business, hardcore business daily operations. And uh, I think this is a number one lesson for myself as an entrepreneur uh, during the pandemics time and post pandemics times is that behavior of my customers, behavior of my team members, uh, my own. Uh, you know, habits really changed. We're, we're really uh, struck by by all the crisis and all the changes. One one example. Interestingly, we have we we've been seeing we have a chain of co-working spaces, and we see a lot of new customers, people who are who don't want to sit in their offices, and all of the sudden, and obviously they cannot work from home, so they are coming to the uh, co um, like um, entrepreneurial creative spaces, and they are working there, and uh, they are learning there. They are learning for the new environment. They are exchanging information simultaneously and doing that uh, while they work, while they actually. Uh, and and the, their behavior completely changed. Um, speaking again about uh, education, I can see that, let's say, uh, my normal schedule would look like a, in a different way. Now I have uh, several applications, including obviously Coursera, that is teaching me how to deal with the marketing in digital era. It's uh, teaching me new skills. And uh, I do that while I drive to my office, yeah? And uh, these are some, uh, like I have both Audible, Coursera, teaching me while I work, while I drive. This is something that, <clears throat> and, and by the way, we're all limited in our travels, yeah? So uh, the, the source that I have is applications. Uh, by the way, YouTube is a great source of knowledge. This, this was something, obviously this didn't uh, start this year. This, this has been gradually changing our lifestyle, but all of a sudden, I think uh, pandemics really increased the speed of this change. So um, staying in touch with your customers through sharing knowledge. This is another thing that I discovered for myself being very, very interesting, useful and, and uh, rewarding. Like I launched my own uh, YouTube channel where I speak with my target audience, uh, young uh, like uh, school student, school pupil, those who would be entering a team university potentially, yeah. And uh, some of my, some of the entrepreneurship knowledge through storytelling, through sharing specific cases, uh, is being done, and this is helping the university to recruit uh, wonderful um, wonderful students. So these are the examples. I think these these are the bright examples of how education is changing how our behavior is changing. And uh, uh, let me uh, tell you that uh, what I wanted to say additionally, yes, another thing, uh, the state's uh, position. I really wanted to say that uh, we have seen how governments actually failed to fulfill their own functions yeah, during the pandemics. Uh, we have seen that a lot of uh, groups, segments of our society uh, needed to be retrained they had to be re-educated because they lost their jobs. So instead of probably uh, spreading uh, cash, which is not being done in all of the countries, but if the countries are really have this cash opportunities, why not spend money to re-educate your population and help them uh, acquire new professions? So these are the things, observations uh, that really come to my mind. And speaking maybe just um, uh, uh, as a, sum as a summary and just probably two words about Team University itself. We are focusing bachelors, which is, a, which is a untapped market for Uzbekistan. I speaking to you, uh, speaking to Alima from Kazakhstan, uh, Kadir from Kyrgyzstan and uh, Sandro from Georgia. I see the statistics of the coverage of the uh, 
students with a higher education, of population with higher education. Kazakhstan has 54% of uh, its population getting the higher education, yeah? More than, ha more than half of that is private. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is probably a bit less, but still very high. Uh, Georgia, when we visited Georgia, so dozens of wonderful private universities, not only in Tbilisi, but all over the places in Georgia. While in Uzbekistan, we still, uh, so we still kind of struggle between 10 and 12%. So this really shows that um, there is a huge problem of coverage. There's a proof uh, of the higher education among the population. There's a huge problem of quality education, uh, which is not up to date, yeah? Very much old fashioned. At the same time, it has to, does, it has to do that leapfrog. It has to change dramatically because the whole um, ecosystem, the whole environment, business environment is changing. So the, um, uh, the challenge for uh, our university as first, uh, I, uh, pr first private entrepreneurial university is to really uh, provide quality education and be a good uh, example for others because government is looking at the private initiatives and saying, uh -huh, aha, are they, are they really managing their mission? Are they really fulfilling what they were saying? If uh, we don't... Uh, uh, execute our mission properly, maybe their attitude towards private education will actually roll back to the previous one where, where they didn't trust private sector in terms of higher education, where they thought that uh, higher education universities is a, is a unique pri pr prerogative of the government itself. So these are the, some, some of the observa observations that I wanted to share. Obviously, I hope we'll have a lot of questions and I can speak a bit more in a, uh, narrow down some of my thoughts. Uh, thank you, Kadir. I hope that works for now. Thanks so much, uh, Hikmat, for sharing your experience and uh, both uh, as an entrepreneur, as a champion of entrepreneurship, but also someone who's been championing education for the new generation of entrepreneurs. Alima, you go next. Uh, you're uh, someone with real, with current uh, experience in teaching at yeah. one of uh, the region's leading universities. Uh, how has uh, the pandemic affected education, and how what were you? What have been your observation in terms of the relevancy uh, of some of uh, the skills and the knowledge that uh, you've been giving to students? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel and for organizing it and for sharing, uh, for letting us share our experiences. Well, um, I, I just want to know, uh, to note, like speaking from my own experience of teaching at Nazarbayev University, uh, we went online starting from March and we're still teaching online. So our campus is empty. <laughs> of students, students are not allowed on campus. So everybody is in their homes, which uh, I guess it's, uh, which is also unexpected. It was unexpected to students because they were in this, you know, like kind of generational um, campus atmosphere. Yeah, where they study hard. Yeah, but they also, you know, socialize and so on. And, but suddenly they are home with their parents. <laughs> Uh, and they are 20, it's not like they are our age, right? They want to, so it's just like, it's, uh, I guess it's more burden on them than on us, but there is also like many burdens that are falling on us. And um, the trends that I'm noticing, like with this uh, kind of change in terms of education going digital, going on Zoom, on YouTube, uh, is that uh, we are noticing the burst of educational bubble. Right and uh, by education, there is a kind of uh, uh, notion of an educational bubble, like a real estate bubble, <laughs> right? So the bubble is that you have to go to some, you know, leading university. You have to pay lots of money for education. That education should cost, and particularly, you know, we know that it was like the uh, sort of the trend set as well the US and the UK where education was is and still is very expensive but nowadays like many of our partners like we have um, uh, and many sort of colleagues in the US and the UK are facing the sort of cuts because the people are asking question why should somebody pay for like sixty thousand dollars for education at Cornell online when you know you can get it on YouTube <laughs> Or you can get it on Coursera and you can get so it's just like and this is uh, sort of uh, uh, I guess hitting them 
but it's also hitting us because we also had this mindset that you know like at least i don't know uh, in our country it used to, like in, in my family it used to be okamasana dumbbell knives and if you don't study if you don't get a diploma from some you know like lead some mgu or i know harvard or you will not be like <laughs> You'll be, uh, you know, sweeping streets, cleaning streets. You'll be a dvornik or somebody in, uh, and this is all, this is all going away because uh, particularly the voice of diplomas, like diplomas, like it doesn't matter whether you graduated from Harvard or you graduated from Shumkent Technical University. Like if you have skills, like speaking, like, you know, communicating, like being good with media, like, you know, going on YouTube and being useful to other people, then it, it really doesn't matter where you hold your degree from. And this is a, a different environment. So all of the global educational hierarchies are going to change and particularly with this sort of a uh, burst of educational bubble, but also with the change of the center and periphery nowadays. Like I am, I was just telling Kadir that I'm now on Zoom from uh, just Kazgan. Uh, I was giving a lecture to Neon Moscow Open University from Shimkent on postcoloniality. I have my YouTube now, like I don't just teach in. Uh, so my the knowledge that used to be only the prerogative of Nazarbayev University students, the you know leading elite, da 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 English language university. Now I am I understand that I have to like I, I don't teach in Russian. I teach in English or uh, in in English. I teach in Russian and Kazakh because I want to reach larger audience. I want to be useful to the people in Kazakhstan because you know they're paying me. <laughs> they are, you know they're saying what's your use to us to people here like in Shimkent and in Jaskazgan and so on and I want to be useful and uh, I'm trying you know like and it's not only me just like generally you know education practitioners they have to be useful locally because uh, one of your questions like what's next in the global uh, for education in the global market and it's a you know, it's it's a construct a global market like what, what what's happening with the global market and and of course like covid is a major kind of uh, localization of all of us right where all our mobility is uh, uh hindered our you know and and we sort of have to uh to look around and see kind of what kind of local knowledge can we produce? What kind of local knowledge is needed for the local market? What what can we do like here, like in just Kazan or in Shimkent and so on? And so, oh, and ma many of my students are not in Astana right now. They are, and, and sometimes it makes me, it makes me really feel good that somebody is, you know, getting on Zoom to listen to some, you know, high uh, brow post-colonial theory from uh, I don't know Katun Karagai from Shiraz Kazakhstan from the uh, Eastern Kazakhstan so it, and it's great so the whole idea of where is the center and where is the periphery and who we, where you have to be in order to be like relevant like you can be I can be in just Kazan and be relevant as long as I you know I go on YouTube and teach and so I don't have to be in Astana I don't have to be in Moscow I don't have to be you know like someplace else so it's just like it's a major game changer for all of us in terms of localization uh then of course the vodka I, I i talked about the cost right like because people are now going to ask like what what is the what is the cost and what is the, what is the input and what is the output of education what do we get in the and they're going to make like uh i guess high, high education practitioners have to be very um like the challenging times are coming when people like in the states like for, we are in the state funded university but even the state is going to ask like what what's your use to us <laughs> what's your like how are you earning your upkeep uh is it is it worth uh for for the state to pay so many grants to students like do we how, how what kind of jobs we need like here on the ground and do we um um what like the, the value of education is going to like be it's you know how we and it, it and it's happening even at the uh not, not only at the higher ed level but also like it's you know how many schools are uh, at least in Kazakhstan, like certain grades don't go to school, and 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 uh, people are organizing locally to have like repeat, uh, like what's called trainers for it's kind of so the education is going outside of, and 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 the 
elementary school and middle school and high school is a still a prerogative of the state, right, in our region. Образование государственное прерогатива, образование бесплатное, but but the states are failing to provide it because of the failing infrastructure, because of so people are organizing themselves too. So maybe uh, like uh, everywhere, including in Kazakhstan and including in the United States. So we're going to rethink all of this, you know, like uh, state, like uh, education as a state provided something good, right? For public, maybe it's going to be community driven, like what's, what's needed for the community, what kind of knowledge is needed. Um, so I talked about the uh, devaluation of formal education and the voice of diplomas, right? So diploma is no longer like what, what, uh, as a piece of paper, <laughs> it's no longer, it's not going to be voice what it used to be voice. Like it's, it's, it's to be like formal requirement. In order to have this job, you have to have a nowadays even big four, like they tell, they don't, you don't need to have a bachelor's to go to be hired for Ernst and Young and so on. So people are adjusting to a new world where these diplomas, they don't hold much value. So if they don't hold much value, like we, we, we are the people who are giving people diplomas, right? <laughs> so we also have to rethink uh, like what kind of, uh, market we have here so the rise of online universities as i said now i have like i have my own youtube channel where i put like the courses i teach like in the post-colonial theory and its application in eurasia and i go on youtube and uh, you know like uh in my class i have 35 students but on youtube i don't know maybe 1000 people from kazakhstan can watch me right and it's uh, it creates like an impact which is which is not yet measured in some, you know, in here for citation, but it's it's a real impact, which I can tell my university, right? So look, or the state, or I don't know, like the funders of the, who are funding our university, like what's your, so this is from my, from my point of view, like what we have to do, how we have to change in order to continue to be useful and to capture the market of uh, education and to stay, um, Actual, like, actual, <laughs> continue to be like uh, useful. So uh, I guess that's like the new kind of localization, socialization, and mediatization of education, which is going on, and we have to uh, um, adjust to it. And I was just telling Kadir how I'm becoming an actress because I'm always my face. Like before that, I used to be. I I have to go to the university and to be dressed and so on. Now the dress doesn't matter, but my face matters, right? <laughs> I have to, like I was producing this uh, ethnography in Kazakh and at Kazakh film and they like put like a ton of makeup on me. And then I was like, oh, oh my goodness, now it's like, uh, uh, like all of these new skills that I didn't have previously of uh, being, uh, putting on makeup uh, for you know like a certain kind of makeup or, or you know like being uh, which i am acquiring now because i have to you know be presentable and so on um so uh this is just like of course a small maybe skill which is not relevant to all of you who are all looking good <laughs> <laughs> you could see my my room now. I am and healthy, yeah, and the room and the, book, the video and production. the bookshelves that you have. To, you know, yeah, 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 and the lights <laughs> and the bookshelves that you have to arrange we'll behind yeah, and, and everything. The corner, right, that you have to arrange yeah. behind you. All of these things yeah. that uh, you know, and that's actually that's what you need. You no longer need these huge auditoriums. You no longer you, you need your 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 corner, your face, your mouse. <laughs> And your head, right, to to be a talking head from on YouTube or uh, somebody like this. So that's, um, I guess, that's my um, little intervention and contribution to our discussion here. Like, if you have questions about how we're doing with all this online education, I'm happy to answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alima. I think uh, there's uh, one side of it, uh, you know, those who want to get education and skills uh, and training by going to schools and universities, but you also highlighted uh, the challenge that you are facing as someone in, you know, uh, in the education sector, who, you know, the, you and your colleagues have to adjust to new realities and also need to adjust in terms of what kind of education to deliver uh, to your students and uh, to, uh, uh, you know, in the future, just adjusting to uh, all the challenges uh, 
that we've been facing because of this pandemic. But it's quite interesting the way you said that, you know, we don't need diplomas anymore, just skills and localization of <laughs> training. <laughs> We have, uh, I want to open uh, our dis discussion. Uh, first of all, we have uh, questions that uh, our friends have submitted through the uh, Q&A uh, box that uh, you all panelists uh, could see, can see. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer to answer any of them, uh, please go ahead. And then also I will allow, uh, I will uh, let uh, our attendees uh, to ask questions uh, through their microphones so we can hear their voices actually and there are a few questions uh, that you see in the uh, Q&A box uh, feel free to volunteer to answer any of them or I will ask uh, you know I will try to assign questions to uh, to you there's a question of uh, what professions of the future can we expect in our countries that's uh, that question is coming from Vyacheslav Khan Sander, Alexander, would you like to take that one? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So basically, uh, uh, there are lists in this document that I mentioned, the skills for 21st century. Uh, in related research, they do have uh, professions of 20, 21st century, and there are like more than 100 professions that didn't exist like 150 years ago, and they now they are becoming uh, the mainstream, like different sorts of developers, of course, software developers, different sorts of user experience designers, data scientists, obviously, robotics and uh, uh, artificial intelligence specialists. So if you just, just search for the list, I mean, there's very long list, but there's one thing I want to point out that, that I think that we are missing. Uh, one thing that we are missing, I think, is that a person of any profession needs to upgrade their, like, we are not IT professionals and we need to, or we are not uh, uh, TV production professionals and we need to deal with makeup, with lighting and so on and so forth. So one thing that we're helping companies in Georgia is to understand that it's not marketing department that it needs to become better at digital marketing. It's every who needs to understand digital marketing, big data concept. It's everyone, all over the company that needs to, to get acquainted. So basically I say that there's one thing that the professions, the people that need to be created for the companies to become effective, but second thing is the listeners. They're saying in Georgia that good, the good talent needs a good listener. So basically you may have best in the world data scientists in a company, but management will not understand them because they haven't heard it about, right? So we invented this, this virtual concept of MDBA, which is Master of Digital Business Profession, uh, Digital Business and Administration. And we have among us within the company saying that, oh, you are MBA, but now it's time for MDBA. So it's now, now it's time to upgrade this broad package of knowledge. So it's not about your particular profession, but because I believe that every one of us follows their own profession and we did follow it 10 years ago or five years ago, but not the wider wider area of technologies and so on. So that's that would be my comment on the professions of the future. Thank you, Sandra. There's a question, a follow-up question. Can you remind uh, us where we can read this document from Vyacheslav who asked this question? Uh, Wikipedia has very good outline of the skills for the 21st century, and it has all the refer references you need. Kadir, can I jump yes, in? Yes, please. Yeah, I really like the last question in the list, but uh, before I go to the question, well, I, I'll read the question, uh, and then I'll give a few comments to what Alima said, and then go back to the question. So yes, the please. question from Omida Faizieva is, what do you think, what kind of additional skills need to be learned and possibly additional programs need to be implemented to ensure effectiveness of online education. So what I wanted to share with you, again, a couple of observations that sh really show how we can actually impact by changing the format. 
normally uh, our co-working spaces had a lot of events like we held uh, dozens of events every month yeah we have uh, five branches each branch had its own uh, its own events on marketing on uh, let's say motivation on uh, presentations different topics and some of them were just uh, rented as a space what happened because of the pandemics we couldn't uh, organize uh, events anymore but what we really did is we actually went to the online so now we have live interviews uh, within ground zero and um, as alima said i personally launched my youtube channel interestingly in terms of statistics you would see that e each event at the co-working space would uh, accommodate 50 people max yeah while uh, being online this can be watched and uh, participated from through uh, through the whole world y the only thing is access is the language either it's in uzbek or in russian or in english so the whole format of learning changed another thing um, going back to nazarbayev university uh, my daughter uh, uh, decided to uh, uh, subscribe on the uh, bootcamp program uh, on math and SAT organized by Nazarbayev University students. And can you imagine how that cost, how much it was? It was only one dollar a day. Can you imagine? So here we have several, a synergy of several things. One, it is a kind of a crowdsourcing platform because it's not only one person who is contributing, it's a group of students who are doing that. Secondly, there is no more like authority type of approach where a teacher or a tutor had to share this knowledge. Normally in Tashkent, I would pay at least 10 bucks an hour for an English speaking math teacher while going through an online platform organized um, by Nazarbayev University students and being given to the whole, I mean, uh, kids in 16s and 17s for $1 a day. This is another example how dramatically the process um, of learning can change. Um, Going back to the question itself, where what kind of uh, skills do we need? Again, as Alima said, this uh, this is funny, but really I have to learn on IT more now as a person who is sharing the knowledge or organizing a business. I need to know the basics of media production. I need to have the basics of data analytics because whatever you do online, it gives you a very, very sophisticated data analytics statistics. But why do you need it if you don't, if you're not, if you can, if you cannot read it and if, and if you cannot implement that? So it's definitely data analytics. It's definitely uh, storytelling because you cannot keep the audience attention without really sharing wonderful stories. While at the audience, you would have this physical contact and it would be a bit different. And, and the data visualization, we have to communicate through slides and they cannot be boring as they were, let's say in the auditorium where again, you could actually use some other additional skills. So speaking about new skills, I would uh, uh, summarize saying that it's definitely IT as Alexandra said, it's um, data analytics and data visualization. It's definitely storytelling uh, capabilities. So these are my takeaways from uh, what's changing in my, uh, let's say, habit of uh, education. Thank you, Ikmat. There's a question from Kuat Takizhanov. If you're ready to uh, ask a question, I will uh, unmute you. Kuat. Hello. Hi, Kuat. Uh, thank you, Kadir. Please go ahead meeting. and ask your question. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I've just left my comment about the, the panel topic. Because um, uh, when I subscribe for this topic, for, for this panel, um, for, for this webinar, I read that the topic is about education in the post-pandemic world. And it's also about skills for the 21st century. And then I saw that, well, it's a very, pretty much global you know, kind of question, right? And pretty much, uh, I would say, <clears throat> I would say uh, modern <laughs> questions like what kind of education, what kind of economy, what kind of politics, what kind of leaders, 21st century. So I think it's a good opportunity to finally begin asking what kind of knowledge we need, actually, and what kind of, and, and yet I see that you keep engaging in this kind of, uh, in the same stories that it's all about good universities, which will, should be privately owned. And those universities will equip students 
with those kind of skills from the developed, so, so to speak, uh, uh, developed world. Instead of talking about how to create and engage in creating and interpreting knowledge. And, and, and for the last 20 years, I would say, whenever I talk to students, they talk about you know, all these transferable skills, which are very important, of course, how to talk, uh, you need to be fluent in English, you know, to get an MBA uh, and management skills and entrepreneurship skills. And yet there is very little understanding that all that at least my comment is applicable to the most relevant to the humanities and social sciences, that what we need and what these countries lack is that we need to talk about how to, uh, uh, to kind of emancipate our knowledge, how to uh, learn people for the critical analysis uh, in our students. I would say I'm not Boston, but you know about Bolashak and you know this uh, Nazarbayev University and pretty much competitive universities like Kimap in Kazakhstan. And there's also so many graduates with master's degree, with MBAs, with a master's degree in law, and it doesn't help much to the countries, right? It doesn't help much because there's a very uh, little, I would say, you know, uh, understanding and engagement and understanding among the epistemic community, among our intellectuals, that what we need is to reconsider the curriculum in our economics departments, for example, right? There is no, you know, uh, I'm afraid if it's too technical, but uh, the, for the last 20 years, the old curriculums in economics departments in humanities are stuffed with, a pre, with the uh, orthodoxy of the neoliberal school, yeah? Uh, of the, ma the so-called mainstream, the mainstream uh, economics, which is completely, you, you know, if you follow the, the news, which is you know, completely, there's a war, you know, in the Western univer universities between orthodox and, and heterodox economics. And yet, again and again, Kazakhstan, uh, the whole red region, Eurasia, we're kind of the mar on the margins of these discussions. When will begin? When when will join those discussions? You know, when I see my colleagues from Latin American countries, from African countries, from other post-Soviet, post -so uh, sorry, post-socialist countries, they at least understand the the need for these discussions. Whereas in our thank you for creating this. In our uh, you know webinars, we're talking about oh how to get another MBA or how it is important to speak English. Uh, and, you know, yeah, I understand it is important. Yeah, people will need jobs and everything. But I think that the, the main mission of uh, the epistemic community of you of us is to change the, the thinking to emancipate people. And our mission is to create knowledge and to interpret knowledge. And if we continue just to consume this fast food, from the West. I don't want to look like a, some kind of, you know, outdated traditionalist who say, oh, we need to, to, uh, to you know, to do our own. No, no, I'm not asking, I'm not uh, calling to create the, the will. All I'm saying is that we need a very much, very much critical engagement in those discussions instead of talking about another MBA degree. Yeah, uh, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Kwadov. <laughs> Absolutely quiet, like, uh, as we say in Kazakh, like this, uh, our thoughts are coming from one place. I was just talking about the uselessness of diplomas nowadays and uh, wherever they're from, from, uh, from the West or from wherever. And the uh, localization of knowledge that, for instance, I'm now teaching in, in Russian on YouTube, <laughs> but also to students and also to the public outside of Nazarbayev University, because, you know, I have to make myself useful locally. And uh, we need to reconsider all of these constructs, like a global market and so on and so forth. Like what, what, uh, what kind of knowledge is needed to, uh, to us uh, to being to able to function. Mm -hmm. Alexander, would you like to uh, respond to Kuat on this? Yeah, my, my thought, the very general thought, I don't want to get into particulars. I think that the same thing is happening everywhere. Like Uber is taking over taxi companies, Airbnb was taking over the, the hotels, and we still don't have the, and 
skill shares maybe of this world and Udemy is do make the democratize the, the flatten the educational market but this will go farther so i think that we, we are heading into the world where every person will be provider of very little piece of brilliant information or brilliant uh, advice right and will end up connected into this matrix where you are receiving thousands of little bits and pieces of puzzle every day, basically, like it's happening through media. The same thing needs to happen through education system, right? And the time of this centralized monopoly on the education, as Zalina said, as Hikmat said, and uh, uh, colleagues of ours, it's ending, basically. And even the school that was created, I know, hundreds of years ago, actually, to somehow serially educate, uh, literate many people, I mean, it's already uh, cast its, its time, basically. And we need to go uh, farther into, into crowd educating, like crowdfunding thing, which is what, what was said already. And I completely support the idea of platforms and everybody becoming an educator and everybody becoming a student for life. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, there's a question uh, from Jehun Balaglan, one of the first questions. Uh, I think uh, this is something that Hikmat could answer. How can we implement mentorship programs for middle managers or aspiring managers uh, to learn from top managers from day-to-day -day activities? This is something that uh, Hikmat, you've been also engaged. Yes, so what I think is important now is that we <clears throat> realize that the changes really affected all layers of management and uh, the least equipped probably people are the mid-management and uh, below. So uh, while, while the result is not uh, definite, yeah, we not um, always know what exactly has to be done. So I think it is crucial that uh, we really uh, uh, we, we really think not in a quite a classical vertical type of management style, but we really kind of put that aside, really engage to our team members as um, horizontal, horizontally. And what we probably need to do is to really communicate more. That's exactly what we faced with our um, uh, with our businesses that deal with um, delivery of equipment and machinery. Yeah, we are one of the leading suppliers of equipment and machinery. All of the sudden, they have financial problems. All of the sudden, uh, they have a lot of questions regarding the payment systems. Uh, obviously, as usually, they have a lot of technical questions. So what we are trying to do now is to really get rid of the bureaucracy and communicate with our peers, with our team members, um, face to face and def and see what can be adjusted. Let's say if that is the price, we adjust the price. If that is customer satisfaction, we, we talk about that. So my suggestion would be to really look at this in a, in a more horizontal, horizontal management style and uh, communicate just as peers because not necessarily uh, the classical top manager would know the answer because the, uh, the environment is very indefinite. The environment is changing all the time. So in these circumstances, my suggestion would be really listen to the market, listen to your customers, communicate with them in a very informal way, as they say, listen to their stories, and try to adjust the product or service based on the information we get from the market. Thank you, Hikmat. Uh, we have a, uh, Janai Sagin. Uh, who would like to ask a question? Jenna, if you're ready, I will unmute you. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, uh, so, so it's, it was very interesting to, to hear that uh, we, we have to use this approach, uh, like lifelong uh, learning approach. And uh, it's a uh, current demand. I see it's more on the... Uh, college level in our region in Kazakhstan. 
So uh, you mentioned about this uh, high-level education universities, but at the same time, as Salima mentioned, we have a big demand in the big unemployment level. People need more support, and <laughs> she's trying to to help more local people. So it's the same trend uh, by the other international organizations like World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and one of the main mission of these organizations uh, 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 support people and to work on the poverty issues. So in Kazakhstan, we have currently a big dilemma uh, how we can implement one of the World Bank project, which is targeted to support 20,000 farmers. And uh, they plan to, to, to invest about half billion dollar, $500 million. And uh, so it's, it's not easy task because uh, previously how it worked, we, we had uh, one uh, state or private state corporation, which calls Kazagra, and these organizations actually use for this type of programs, just to uh, this organization receive this money and they try to uh, support farmers in our region in Kazakhstan. But this organization somehow used uh, m m uh, most of the money inefficiently. They had the losses about $300 million during the last year. And uh, they just they supported, this organization supported about five or 10 big corporations in Kazakhstan. And uh, all this investment were generally uh, inefficient. And uh, we had a big uh, uh, bank, Cessna Bank, which collapsed. And uh, all this investment, which were uh, for, for farmers and they, they had also problems because farmers in the rural areas simply are not well educated uh, to use properly this money to manage and uh, to work with this money. And World Bank decided to use a new approach. They're trying to implement a new program which calls uh, financial instrument uh, to, which will support based on result. But to implement this program, it's not easy. You have to, it's necessary to train a big number of farmers, 20,000 farmers. And it's very complicated because we don't have proper TWET, technical vocation, vocational uh, training program in Kazakhstan. Simply it's uh, disappeared. Before we had this uh, uh, training program, schools, but now we have just schools and universities. Well, we don't have college system. So it's necessary to work on this issue as quickly as possible to train these people. Otherwise, it will be the same situation what it happened before with this uh, Kazagra. So it's two line. So it's necessary to develop a proper approach. If we develop, uh, if we try to develop uh, something like Nazarbayev University, it will be very costly, take a lot of money and so on. So one way, uh, if we develop like, local Kazakh ones, it will very consuming and uh, takes time. And maybe it's uh, more rational to adapt uh, experience from other countries like Canada maybe or Germany, uh, which already have this type of training program and to have may, may, uh, maybe their branches in our region. So this is my question, yeah. Kadir and Alexander, Kikmat, maybe if you, Alima, <laughs> if you give some strategy, what's the best way, what's the most rational way to find a good balance to, to develop win-win strategy? Thank you. Please, Alexander. Thank you, Janai. Uh, my my uh, response will be very, very short because th that's what I believe is that platforms need to be created and the global competition needs to start, right? As Alima said, every provider, every person who knows anything is potentially provider. So if they use maybe expensive and highly qualified people to do the contents of what they need for the farmers, right? Through research of the needs or something. And then the providers need to have access to this universal, very open, uh, area actually where everyone can contribute and then the farmers will, will choose themselves and another component will be uh, guaranteeing access to farmers to this platform whatever public platform is used because we need definitely we have a lot of farmers with limited access so my my uh, response in short will be global competition but unfortunately that's not something you find people willing to do when they are about to spend half a billion of world bank's money because there are other motives and it's all, always more, more and more useful to bring this money into into single channel where it's much easier to 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 operate with it so global competition thousands of providers would be my take on it
Thank you, Alexander. I hope uh, that was uh, helpful. Uh, Janai, thank you for uh, asking the question. Uh, we have, uh, let's uh, take a couple more questions and then uh, wrap it up as we started losing uh, our attendees. Uh, uh, there's a question again from uh, uh, Umida. Uh, how to standardize online education? And should there be specific standards at all to identify the quality, like criteria for giving stars to hotels? For example, who, what are the criteria that can help us estimate certain courses, certain universities that offer online education to understand their worth uh, uh, to attend and they're not superficial? Ademai, you nodding. I guess you have some thoughts on this. Well, I still, I still think some of the sort of institutions of reputation like uh, would work for not, not, I don't know, maybe not certifying as it would be difficult to organize the certification certification but the sort of you know like how if I produce a course like online then some of my colleagues say you know this is a good course that I'm using and so on and it use it's just like and if the colleagues go there and find it unsatisfactory and so on that will you know affect my reputation right so uh, I think this sort of uh, reputation you know peer review process maybe make it less formal and so on uh, so far it's, I mean it, it's, it's still working right on academia that they do and so on the processes of peer review and but now it's also more public right because it's available to everybody right so uh, I think uh, I, I don't know if there will be I don't know if you want the state to come in and to start certifying like everybody uh, I don't know if they have uh, access to if, if they can organize it or yeah it's just like what what kind of courses what kind of uh, content we're talking about of course there are standards for adapted standards for education which are nowadays like we, we were thinking today, like um, when we were driving with colleagues, we were discussing how, um, you know, everything is online and the classes of Fiskultura is <laughs> are also online <laughs> because there are standards like, like the, it has to be and people have to get paid, uh, you know, and how are they going? So it's just like, but it doesn't make any sense, right? That they're spending. <laughs> This uh, taking everybody's time to, you know, uh, zoom in and so on. So it's just like uh, the same with like maybe other standards. So I think standards also might change about so. But obviously there is a state standard, which is, you know, like, which is already in the system, which you cannot change about like classes and things. And, and they have not yet adapted to online and so on. So. Uh, just just an example of how things are changing quick and how things are becoming standards are becoming outdated and changing quickly. Yep. Thank you, Arima. I hope Omida, you liked uh, uh, the question, uh, the answer from Arima. And there's uh, one last question that I would pose to our panelists and uh, Alexander Hikmat. Uh, uh, Alima, you could uh, volunteer and any, any of you could take this question from Rustam Ahmetov. Hi, fellow members. Rustam from Kazakhstan Sela 13. My question is about teaching of bachelor's, master's, and executive students, as well as Sela students, of uh, mindfulness as a skills instead of leadership. I'm doing this program in Almaty University. Anybody? I guess he's talking about uh, mindfulness uh, as more uh, the something that should be taught as a skill. Any thoughts? Uh, can I? Yeah, please. Yeah. So if I, I'm not sure if it can be some somehow put on the YouTube, right? But I believe that that's the best start because if anything can be put, I mean, best assessor, best rater or <laughs> rating as, uh, assignment and so on nowadays is uh, viewer basically, right? If it's more complex and needs presence, and needs uh, collective cooperation and so on, that then, then it will be much difficult here, but you can definitely use Zoom and platforms like others. I mean, where there's no point, I believe, in 
pushing it before it's popular. So the direction is make it popular and then push it anywhere you want. Because once there are people who want to learn it, they will find the way actually to connect. So I, I would say that putting it in, in on YouTube in some way, learning the skills to do it right, I think uh, is the best start. That, that would be my take. Thank you, Alexander. Well, we've, uh, we've gone over an hour uh, and I really truly enjoyed uh, this webinar, the discussion and our attempt, uh, our efforts to look beyond the pandemic and see what kind of education we will need, uh, the, our countries will need. This is something important and I hope that uh, this uh, was uh, interesting for uh, our participants, for our friends uh, from SELA uh, and will stimulate uh, further uh, thoughts and uh, thinking and discussions um, on this topic. And I would like to thank uh, our panelists. Uh, Arima, thank you very much for making it uh, to the webinar uh, on time. You didn't miss it. <laughs> and I'm glad that you made it to Jessica's Gan safely. Thank you, Hikmat, for your time and sharing your experience in, in uh, leadership and entrepreneurship and uh, education. I really applaud your efforts on uh, education. Uh, uh, and uh, Alexander, thank you for working with me on putting this together. This was a wonderful uh, event. I really enjoyed uh, working with all of you. Kadir, thank you for the initiative, excellent yeah, initiative. Absolutely. And I, I think that we have a lot of great people and we need to make it as uh, regular as possible to maybe start with once a month and then, then the, see how it goes. Because even if we have like 20 people interested in particular topic, I believe that, that that's excellent way to engage in this permanent being cell, permanent seller member and permanent uh, lifelong learner. Thank you very this much. This was a good start. Very good initiative. <laughs> really enjoyed thank it. Thank you, thank you. Bye, thank you everyone. bye everyone. Thank you, thank you. Bye bye. Bye.